song number 471 will be our song of encouragement after the lesson this morning. A couple of weeks ago, I prepared a lesson discussing the role of Christian women in the Lord's church. And during that lesson, we discussed the great importance of the Christian wife, the Christian mother, and the Christian female in general, and just a few of her God-given roles in her Christian life. We do not hear enough lessons like this, in my opinion, not only concerning the Christian woman's role as queen of the Christian home, but also that of the respective roles of a Christian father and Christian children. And as a side note right here regarding my mention of Christian children, I've read and heard of late that some within our brotherhood are now denying the fact that there is such a thing as Christian children which may surprise many of you since a lot of people that we know and even our own families have had at times Christian children living within our own families. But I want you to listen to this quote by a brother that was made on a Facebook post this past week. And this is a quote. He says, Baptism is for adults, young and old, but never children. As per the church, and this is, was said on the Church of Christ Bible only Facebook group, a group that me and two other Christian men had been helping to administrate for some brethren. And this past week, all three of us was rudely removed from that position of administrating that group. But this brother went on in his Facebook post I just quoted to you to post a YouTube video for, for his sister with which he was in discussion in which he discussed when a young person should decide to become baptized. Although he had just said in this other post to this same woman that it was for adults, not children, but adults only that were uh, candidates for baptism. So one would assume his answer to that question was already obvious by what he had already said. But he went ahead and posted this YouTube video, and I went and watched it, and so did this other lady to whom he was uh, posting to. And as I watched that particular video, uh, the YouTube video on the subject, he answered the question again by stating what was he called, in his own words, his opinion based solely upon his own reasoning. And of course, that's not what we look for in Bible answers to Bible questions. We don't look to our own opinion and to our own reasoning for such. But those were his words, not mine. But he said this was when a person, a young person, began to have a.k.a. sexual thoughts or sexual contact with someone that they should consider becoming a Christian because they are considering and about to become accountable for their sins, sexual sins. Of course, as false teachers typically do, it was not just a few words later in the same video at the end of it that he straightly contradicted what he had just said and says that anyone who is a believer in Jesus Christ is ready to be baptized in the Christ. So he would ask this brother this question, which is it? Is it at the age at which one has sexual thoughts or contact that one should be baptized for the remission of sexual sins only? Or is it at the age, whatever age that may be, that they become a believer in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, that they would become accountable for their sin? Well, fortunately for us, we do not have to depend on mere men for such answers to such eternally important questions. For the Son of God answered this question for us himself. The Son of God said in Mark 16, 16, It is he who believes and is baptized that shall be saved. And so Christ said it is for those who become believers that are candidates for baptism. He doesn't stipulate anything concerning sexual contact, sexual thought, 
or sexual sin for that matter. He says that when one becomes a believer in Jesus Christ, that is the point at which they become a candidate for baptism. And so I will take God's word for this, the Son of God's word for this, instead of this brother who is teaching this particularly troubling false doctrine. However, this was not the beginning of this brother's false teaching on this occasion, nor was he alone in his ill deed for which I have publicly corrected them, or am publicly correcting them this morning, and will be continuing with as I talk with their elders later on. But this whole affair began earlier this week when I received a text message from another brother who admins this same group asking me this question. I've noticed women posting scripture. What are your thoughts on this? I've noticed women posting scripture on the Facebook group. What is your thought on this? I see nothing wrong with questions, but posting scripture, I believe, is leaning toward teaching. I replied to him this reply. I've been mulling over this myself of late. I see no real issue with it as long as they do not try to usurp their authority over men in the group. I have had several of late get very rude and out of line in that they do not have the spirit that a Christian woman should have, and I have removed them. Those who ask questions and offer scriptures as an answer to comments or encouragement do not seem to fall into the category of usurping, but some comments certainly have. I would like to hear what others think on this as well. I actually taught a lesson on it a couple of weeks ago due to some posts on this group and on my general Facebook post. Now, brethren, all of us know that we have heard lessons in the past on the role of Christian women in the Lord's Church. And it is a subject that most of us all have heard more than once. And the scriptures we are about to discuss are not scriptures that are new to any of us. But what some of us may not know is how some of our brethren, known as our non-institutional brethren, have handled these verses in the past. But many of them have been taught better, thankfully, and have learned the truth on the matter. At least our non-institutional brethren have. However, many of them still have a long way to go on this issue and on other issues that I've discussed from this very pulpit, but thankfully this is not one we've had to discuss concerning our non-institutional brethren. We are having to discuss it now concerning some brethren that as far as I know are not non-institutional. But they are well on their way to becoming such if they continue on this path. As with, as with most subjects one could mention when it comes to women's role in the Lord's church, one could cover various subtopics under this one major topic. Subjects like, may a Christian woman preach for a mixed group of Christian men and women? Are they allowed to teach Bible study classes of mixed Christian boys and Christian girls or just non-Christian boys and girls? Are they allowed to make announcements during worship assemblies or mixed, or mixed assemblies of Christian men and women? Are they allowed to lead a public prayer in a worship assembly of mixed Christian men and women? Are they allowed to serve on the Lord's table during communion? Does the Bible teach that there is such a thing as a female Christian elder? And it may surprise you that I received a post just this last week showing where a congregation had appointed two female elders at their congregation. Of course, not realizing that one of the qualifications of an elder is that he be married and have children. <laughs> and so uh, this Christian woman, of course, cannot be married to a wife. She has to be married to a husband. And so this causes many problems in the Lord's church when we fail to understand what the qualifications and the roles are, all of our respective roles in the church as men, women, and Christian children in the church. And may I say all of these are excellent questions that I've just mentioned that most of, but most of us know the answer to. 
And if we do not, we will hear the answer to most of these questions in our lesson this morning because the same biblical principle that applies to the question that we will be discussing discussing will answer the same question for us as most, if not all, of these that we have mentioned. However, the Bible question we want to get a Bible answer to this morning is one which may not have ever crossed your mind, and that is because most can apply the scriptural principles in these other areas just as well to every area of life than they can the ones that we've mentioned, logically speaking. But the question I am referring to this morning is if a Christian woman is allowed to teach or make a religious comment in the presence of Christian men outside of the worship assembly without attempting to usurp authority as part of her everyday life and her everyday Christian walk of life as one seeking to raise her family, encouraging and edifying her mate as well as her brethren in such places as a midweek Bible study class, in magazine articles that have been written by women in some of our Brotherhood publications in the past, books that our Christian women have written, and yes, even comments on social media such as Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, which is really how this whole subject came about this morning. It's because this other admin had asked me if it was appropriate for Christian women to be doing anything more than just asking questions on Facebook. They shouldn't be teaching, is what he is claiming. So in order to begin answering this question, let us turn over to 1 Corinthians 14 and look at verses 22 through 25 first. We're going to learn the context of which Paul is discussing women keeping silent in the churches in this particular context in 1 Corinthians 14. And we're going to start off by looking at verses 22 through 25 for us to understand when and where this applies in this particular case here. Starting at 1 Corinthians 14, verse 22, this is what we read. Therefore tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. But prophesying is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. Therefore if the whole church come together in one place, and all speak with tongues, and there come in those who are uninformed or unbelievers, will they not say that you are out of your mind? But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or an uninformed person come in, he is convinced by all, he is convicted by all. And thus the secrets of his heart are revealed, and so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is truly among you. So as we can see, the Apostle Paul is discussing a meeting of Christians in which miraculous gifts are being practiced in the first century as some, but of course not all, had the ability to perform. As we learned this past Lord's Day, this came about through the impartation of miraculous gifts bestowed upon a certain number of believers on the first Pentecost after the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ as recorded in Acts chapter 2. And the laying on of the apostles' hands upon a smaller group of the larger number of obedient believers on that occasion, those of which the Lord shall call. We remember that phrase, shall call. As per Joel 2.32 and Acts 2.39 where that phrase is used. But what kind of meeting of Christians was this according to what the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to write concerning what we've read here in these few verses and what we will read after this concerning women remaining silent? Well, in verse 23, we get that answer because Paul tells us there plainly, Therefore, if the whole church comes together in one place, there is our context. When the whole church comes together in one place, 1 Corinthians 14, 23. So hopefully no one missed that and no one is confused about that. So now, to, now let us pick up reading where we left off at verse 26. How is it then, brethren, when you come together, each of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, 
has a revelation, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. If anyone speaks in a tongue, let there be two or at the most three, each in turn. And let one interpret. But if there is no interpreter, let him keep silent in church, and let him speak of himself and to God. Let two or three prophets speak, and let the others judge. But if anything is revealed to another who sits by, let the first keep silent. For you can all prophesy one by one, that all may learn and all may be encouraged. And the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. As in all the churches of the saints. Let your women keep silent in the churches. For they are not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive as the law also says. And if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home... For it is shameful for women to speak in church. Or did the word of God come originally from you? Or was it you only that it reached? If anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things which I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. But if anyone is ignorant, let him be ignorant. Therefore, brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy and do not forbid to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. Now these verses are quite clear. That in this context, women were to remain silent. But not only were the women to keep silent during this assembly of the Lord's church, because it was an obvious worship service in which miraculous gifts were being practiced, Although one which we dare not could repeat in our current day and age because those miraculous gifts no longer exist, certain men also were told to keep silent in those verses. As you can see from 1 Corinthians 14 verse 28, if they had the miraculous gift of speaking in tongues, which comes from the Greek word glossa, meaning the language of di or dialect used by particular people distinct from that of other nations, according to Thayer's definitions in my eSword software. And there was not present an interpreter. They were to keep silent. However, we also see that Paul commanded by the Spirit says, let all things be done decently and in order. So he also wanted those with such gifts to speak in turn, saying... That uh, in verse 29, let two or three prophets speak, and let the others judge. But if anything is revealed to another who sits by, let the first keep silent. So silence here is being used regarding men and women. It's not just being used regarding women. And so it, it's at this point that we need to get a definition of the word silent, as it's been used here three times in these verses already. Because contrary to the meaning that some want to place on the word silent, it does not mean complete and total silence. That is, not speaking or uttering a word or a sound. In fact, according to Thayer's Greek definition, the English word silent as used in this verse, we have thus far seen is Strong's number G4601 being the Greek word sagao, which is defined by Thayer's as to hold one's peace. And in fact, it is translated very similarly to that in the King James Version in verse 30, just in case you were reading from a King James Version when I quoted the verses earlier. You may not have been. But in verse 30, it actually reads, If anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. Well, that phrase, hold his peace, is the same Greek word as the word silent. It's just in the New King James Version, all three places that that word appears, it's translated to silent. But in the King James Version, it actually says there, hold his peace. But it is the same Greek word, Strong's number G4601, as used in all three occurrences that we have read in the verses, 
including that regarding the Christian women. That it does not nor ever has demanded an absolute unqualified silence in these verses can be seen in its use regarding the men in verse 28 and verse 30 of 1 Corinthians chapter 14. They were the ones doing the speaking in tongues on this occasion and could continue speaking as long as they did it decently and in order by taking turns one after the other as long as they did it this way. The men could continue speaking, so we know it didn't mean complete and total silence concerning the men. But the women is a different story on this occasion as far as them being able to speak. It does not mean that they could not utter a sound, though. It just means that they were to hold their peace during this particular service. And so we see in verse 34 that it says, Let your women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but they are also to be submissive, as also the law says. But again, I want to stress that this does not mean complete and utter silence. Else we know that our Christian women would not be permitted to sing. Songs of worship and praise as we are all commanded in such verses as Ephesians 5.19 and Colossians 3.16. And all of our brethren have understood this for time and eternity except for a chosen few of late. And so we know that there is an exception to the rule from this very fact, but we also need to understand that according to the context of these verses, the silence commanded of the women was not complete and total silence, that concerning the fact that the Holy Spirit had inspired Paul, that they were not to teach the people during a called assembly of the church. Remember, it's a called assembly of the church, according to verse 23, when the whole church comes together in one place. But they were or are not to interrupt those who speak, for most scholars agree that on that occasion it was probable that some of those women were pretending to have miraculous gifts and to be inspired, and were assuming or usurping the role of a public teacher during these assemblies. And that is why they were told to hold their peace and to be silent. As we continue looking briefly at this particular Greek word, sagao, we see that it is found infrequently in the Bible some 19 times in the Greek Old Testament, or the Septuagint. And it's used less than 12 times in the New Testament, and that we should always let the context where it is seen determine its true meaning. For example, in the Old Testament, in Exodus 14, 14, when the Israelites were pursued by the Egyptians, at the Red Sea it says that they were terrified and complained of their plight to Moses, who told them that Jehovah would fight for them, but they were to hold their peace. In other words, to be silent. And that obviously did not mean they were forbidden to speak at all, but rather they were to cease their whimpering and complaining on that occasion. We can see a similar example of this in Psalm 32, verse 3, regarding David as he describes some burdens that he bore in life as a result of his own weaknesses. A New Testament example of this same meaning is seen in Luke chapter 9, verse 36, regarding the disciples after they had witnessed the trans transfiguration scene and that it is said there that they kept kept this matter close and that is the same Greek word G4601 where it is translated there keep it close they were told to keep it close they were told not to be completely silent in general but to keep this matter close in order, in other words, not to speak about it. Keep it close. Not to just cease speaking altogether. However, to help us better understand what is being said in here in 1 Corinthians 14, 34, in a called assembly of the church, I want us also to look quickly at 1 Timothy chapter 2 and see that these verses discuss the same general subject of Christian women but also in a called assembly of the church. Now before we begin looking at these verses in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 through 15, I must again point out the context in which these words are being addressed 
because some people do not seem to understand this or simply fail to accept it. Although it will become clear from what is being said that these verses pertain to a called assembly of the church, we can also see that this is the case from what the Apostle Paul was inspired to write just a few words after those we are about to discuss. If we keep in mind that the original epistles were not written in chapter and verses, it was written as a letter. It was written in letter form. And so we can't just simply say because one subject appears in one chapter that it's not talking about the same thing in another chapter. This was not originally written in chapters and verses. It was written as one long letter. And so let us keep that in mind as we're reading this to see what the context is. And so as we get down to our lesson text, if we were to simply look just a little bit further at 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, Paul mentions there the qualifications of the position of a bishop. But in regard to this work, he asks a rhetorical question in verse 5. That should help us all to see the context under discussion, for he asks there, For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Showing a clear distinction in one's own house and that of the church of God. However, that point is made even clearer as he continues to speak of the qualifications of a deacon in verse 8, which is again a position of servitude in the church, not in our everyday lives, because neither a deacon or an elder follows us around in our everyday lives making sure that we stay in the path of God. Their work is in the church, primarily in the assembled church. Yes, sometimes there's overlap in those situations, but we know that there is a separation, a clear separation seen in the scriptures of the two areas of life. But as we go on and look at, when we reach 1 Timothy 3, 14 and 15, Paul makes this distinction even more clear. As he says there, these things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly, but if I am delayed, I write to you that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So now, if we cannot see that these roles being discussed are those pertaining to our work and service within called assemblies of the church, I'm afraid we are missing something that God really wants us to see a clear distinction in regarding the topic of silence this morning. But as we get back to our lesson, let's look at verse 8. He says, There I desire that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting, in like manner also that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing, but which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. Let a woman learn in silence with all submission, and I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence." For Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Nevertheless, you will be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, love, holiness, and self-control. And so if this doesn't pertain to just church assemblies and the gatherings of the church, women are to remain silent all the time. Right? If we can't see a clear distinction in that somehow... They're being told to be silent and not to teach or usurp authority over a man. So if it doesn't pertain just to church assemblies and to public teaching like the other verses did that we've discussed this morning, then Christian women have a definite problem in life. They can't evangelize. They can't do a lot of other things that we're going to discuss this morning either. But there is a problem with the thinking of some people concerning these verses. And so we see again that the context of what is being discussed are those things pertaining to a called worship assembly and not the everyday affairs and activities of a Christian woman's life. Or at least some of us will have seen that. So our question becomes now, are these commands to keep silent and not to teach or usurp authority over a man 
just those pertaining to called assemblies of the church in regard to religious matters? Or can women speak or make comments that teach in other areas of life regarding spiritual matters in the presence of Christian men as long as they do not try to overstep their bounds of being in submission, according to 1 Timothy 2, verse 11, without violating other Christian principles? Well, some have so asserted in the past, and some in just the past week, in fact, that they cannot. The consequences of such a false doctrine as this is much more far-reaching than these brethren may have imagined, though, not to mention that it is simply not in keeping with what we have studied in the Bible. This would mean that Christian women could not make a comment during a Bible study class even when done respectfully and in submission to the male teacher and others present on that occasion who are Christian men. But such does not violate the scriptures read because we have learned this, that it is in regard to a Christian worship assembly, the church assembling for worship. Some have taken this into a different extreme in that they say that the church is the church all of the time. And apparently we are all called together in one place all the time in the world. And work, this includes work and play and every aspect of their life. And apparently they must think we are in constant state of worship all of the time. If the church exists all the time and we are a part of the church assembled all the time, then we must be in worship all of the time. But I'm sure they would deny this in many other cases, and most of our brethren would. But this is the logical conclusion...